My name is Amata and in this Red Gaming Tech video I am here with the latest from the tech world in the last 24 or so hours. So what do I have for you today my friends? Well, a couple of Intel pieces to kick things off and the first one is going to be some news regarding the Intel discrete GPU codenamed Arctic Sound and then we're going to be talking about how Intel could be developing its own big dot little x86 adaptation. And speaking of graphics cards, it's seeming what we're finally Finally seeing graphics card prices drop a little bit in our next topic and then to close out the video We have some 2600 benchmarks posted by a Chilean user giving us a rather nice preview of the processor And we also have an early preview of the performance of the 2700X But as I said, let's start things out with Arctic Sound so of course, when Intel first set the industry ablaze with the news that they're going to be entering the discrete GPU market, we're all talking about how Roger Kadori was probably going to be focusing on edge applications and maybe data center as well. But one Ashraf Essa of The Motley Fool has something else to say. Apparently there's going to be a gaming variant as well. And I'm going to read the tweet that he said, he's a quote, bonus, apparently Raja on the Edge is redefining Arctic Sound, first Intel DGPU, was originally targeted for video streaming apps in data center, but now being split into two, the video streaming stuff and gaming apparently wants to quote, enter the market with a bang. I know a quote within a quote within a quote, getting all inception on here. But the TLDR of all of that is that there's a gaming variant and of Raja is probably going to be using his many years of experience to take what they've been doing with Arctic Sound and give us some pretty nice stuff. We do have some further news on this, again, regarding, sorry, thanks to Ashraf, and we're going to be seeing two code names, as we already knew, Arctic Sound and Jupiter Sound, and Arctic Sound is going to be the first iteration, which will have 12th gen graphics, and according to Ashraf, they'll be fabricated using EMIP. So, what that basically means, we're going to be looking at Intel, sorry, Intel, integrated, excuse me, packages like the Intel 8809G. So what else did they have to share with us? Well, apparently the Arctic Sound GPU is going to be an MCM module, multiple dies are getting connected via EMIB, and is going to be going head to head with what Intel and AMD work together to bring to the table. However, after that is Jupiter Sound, which is going to be 13th generation graphics. We don't even know the timeline for this product at the moment. It's just all very mysterious. All that we know is that it's going to be the thing after Arctic Sound. As for one we also Arctic Sound, however, the tentative timeline is 2020. And given that roadmaps can often be changed and often are, up to, are updated to, you know, d delay products or what have you, I would be surprised to see it later th than that. But for the moment, 2020 is what we're looking at. So let's move on to our next Intel item, which is, of course, Big Dot Little. And for those of you wondering what on earth I'm talking about when I say that, Big Dot Little is an ARM innovation which basically is to minimise power draw on mobiles. And it is basically a heterogeneous multi-core CPU with a few big high performance CPU cores working alongside extremely low power little CPU cores. So essentially, because obviously the low power ones consume much less, much less power excuse me, at maximum load, than the high performance in their minimum power states, the higher power cores are basically power gated when they're not needed for the system, which obviously for a mobile device is going to be basically all of the time, but they're there for if the device actually requires it. And this is once again thanks to the tech stock analyst Ashraf Essa once again from The Motley Fool, so he's just full of interesting speculations today. And we're going to be seeing Intel take a swing at its own heterogeneous multi-core CPU, and it's going to be codenamed Lakefield, and it's going to be combining some of their previous cores, because they do already have low power CPUs and they already have high power CPUs for the mobile market, so it makes sense that they would basically use what they have already to make this big dot little variation. So again, we're going to be seeing Ice Lake compared with, tr uh, compared, combined with Tremont, and the Ice Lake micro architecture is expected to be powering the 10th gen processors and will be succeeding both Coffee and Cannon Lake. The Tremont is obviously the lower power end of this particular spectrum. So interesting stuff, of course, whether or not we ever see this come out onto the market or how long it's going to take is another matter entirely. But it definitely is interesting that Intel has set their sights on this as well. And we're going to be seeing them basically combine the two worlds to try this rather interesting innovation from ARM. But speaking of graphics cards, let's move on to a reduction in price, which is words I've been hoping to say for a long time. 
So I don't really need to tell you too much about the tale of woe that has been pricing and the extreme shortage in the graphics card market that's been going on for both AMD and Nvidia, but it seems that finally supply is beginning to minimize. Normalize, sorry, not minimize, excuse me. Now these figures are thanks to WCCF Tech, so of course we'll link their article in the description below this video. But the TLDR is they've been keeping a close eye on things and they've noticed that during March we saw prices decrease by as much as a third on high-end graphics cards such as the Vega 64 and 1080 Ti and we also saw price drops on mid-range graphics cards as well and their price declined excuse me, by anywhere between 15 to 30% with an average price drop of around 25%. And according to them, and again this is purely based upon their research, supply levels have been better. Basically they've been seeing the words out of stock less, which is a, a site that has been depressingly common for those looking for a graphics card in the last few months. And you might say, okay, why is this? You're probably not because the answer is fairly clear. We are seeing ASICs come out into the market and of course we have the re reveal just yesterday of the very first ASIC for Ethereum which would basically mean that miners who want to mine Ethereum are no longer really all that interested in gaming graphics cards to do their mining and are more got their eyes set on that juicy juicy ASIC. Now I did speculate that this would cause a decrease in price of course it's hard to say exactly how long this will last, if this is just a momentary drop, or if prices will continue to drop, or if they're going to level out at this point. But regardless of why, or who caused it, or whatever, I'm just glad, to be honest, that we're seeing prices be not as crazy, because while they're still a lot higher than they should be, the fact that we're finally seeing prices start to come down is a positive in my book. Anyway, let's move on to the star of our show, which is regarding the Ryzen 5 2600. So this is all thanks to a user over in Chile who managed to get their hands on the upcoming 2600 and kind, lovely, generous soul that they are decided to share with the world some wonderful performance benchmarks. But before we get to the actual results, let's talk what the chip was actually tested on because that is important. So we have an ASRock or ASRock, depending on your pronunciation, X370 Tai Chi motherboard with a P4.60 BIOS. Now the fact that it's a 300 series motherboard is important. As I mentioned before, there are some features that the Ryzen 2000 series has that are not supported by 300 series motherboards, such as XFR 2.0 and Precision Boost 2.0. Now that by no means we should chuck these results in the bin, but it is something to tuck under your hat. We also have 16 gigabytes of memory, DDR4 of course, which is running at 21.33 megahertz. So of all that out of the way, let's talk facts and figures, shall we? Have some scores. First one is going to be Cinebench R15. And we see a score here of 1384 at 4.0 GHz with the memory at 3333, or 3333. And of course you can see below it that it did do better than the i7 4770K. But of course falls short of the result that we can see for the 8700K which is 1679. And that is from a previous test, not on this test by the way, just in case you are a little unclear. Now we also see some results for Ada64. So we have... 46,787 or 46787 megabytes second read, 46,397 megabytes second write, and 43,877 megabytes a second copy speed. And this is with a maximum of 61.0 latency. And these were obtained with the memory running at 3,466 megahertz with CL14 timings. Now further according to the user they also ran Prime95 with the CPU clocked at 4.1 GHz however the result was that it went down to 1.344 on load before crashing they also attempted 4.2 GHz but the system hung and then crashed when trying to run Prime95. Now we also have some performance results thanks to a benchmark done by El Chapuza Informatico. I probably just butchered the pronunciation of that because to be real with you, I don't speak a lick of Spanish. I wanted to learn it in school and I literally wasn't allowed because the class that they had was very small for it and it was already full. And they were like, yeah, you can learn French instead. And I'm like, okay, but yeah. Spoiler alert, I don't understand French either, so... 
<laughs> anyway, that's completely off topic. So, they managed to get their hands on a Ryzen 7 2700 100X. Now, this isn't a complete review by any means, as we're missing you know, stuff like gaming results, which is fairly important. However, they did run a wealth of tests that I would be remiss not to mention. So, let's start things off with W Prime. So we have the single results first with a result of 36,101 for the Ryzen 7 2700X coming in in the middle of the pack. So it's basically ahead of all the other Ryzen CPUs in this particular chart, but it's below all of the Intel ones. For multi, however, unsurprisingly, we're suddenly seeing the 2700X at the top. As always, AMD definitely do better in multi results. So we see a score of 3,813 rising above well, well, Ryzen and of course beating the 8700K rather resoundingly. Now we're going to move on swiftly to R15, of course Cinebench. Now again we see some impressive results here from the 2700X as it beats basically itself, the 1700X, obviously not literally itself, but you kind of get my point, as we have a score of 1748 versus the 1550 of the 1700X, which of course in itself beats the 8700K, which had a result of 1425. Now the last benchmark I want to touch on from these guys, and I will include a link to their article in the description below this video. If you speak Spanish, you're probably going to get more from it than I can. However, the last benchmark I want to focus on here is the one that they did for X264. So once again, we see the 2700X and the 1700X at the top. Obviously the 2700X reigns supreme with a score of 51, and then we have the 1700X just below that with 46, and then the 8700K just below that at 45. So as you can see, it absolutely smashes it versus the previous iterations of Ryzen, and again, scores rather nicely against the 8700K. Oh, actually, small lie just previously there, because that's one more benchmark I want to, I want to touch on before I call out this segment. And this is going to be 3D Mark Firestrike. Apologies there, folks. I almost forgot about that one. However, we do see the 8700K at the top here, but it is a very slim difference between the two as we see a result of 16.271 for the 2700X and a result of 16.84 for the 8700K. But if you compare the 2700X to the results that we saw with the Ryzen 7, 1700X and the Ryzen 5s, you can see the difference that we can, well, see in this new generation in comparison to the previous iteration. So all around is just looking like a solid improvement. So that is me done for this video. Do let me know your thoughts and opinions on everything I've discussed today. You've heard me talk for quite some time now, so it's only fair that you get to air your views and your woes in the comments below. Do remember to like and subscribe as always. Your support really does make a huge difference. Thank you again for watching. I'll see you next time.